I want my son, mommy. I want some. I want my son, mommy. Peter the Hustler. Y'all better watch it. That's a bad woman. I'm just waiting on her to make a few million so I can borrow $50. That's all I'm going to say. All right, we're getting ready to go live, but before we get into our discussion, I got something that I want you guys to see. So everybody, we're gonna give everybody a chance to get in. And until they do, I'm gonna give y'all a chance to see something that I feel is very important. When it comes to self-defense, gun ownership, second amendment, blacks in America. And when I say America, I say it like a second amendment person. America. Go ahead, Zeke, give it a try. America. America. <laughs> America. All right. I want y'all to watch a few clips from this video. This is an individual who calls himself Iraq Veteran 8888. Now, I've researched this individual because he is one of the Second Amendment NRA right-wing Southern gun advocates and this is one of the individuals that some of our so-called black gun how can I say black gun advocates leaders they've been leading us to associate with but before I show you Iraq veteran 88 hand me that child I'm gonna show you one of the reasons that we all have to be ready to protect ourselves look at this everybody 88 see rogue 1831 just said it a lot of people don't know I was going to bring that up later, Rule 1831, but you brought it up already. We're going to get to that. Hidden, yeah, hidden mommy, racism, mommy, and Maj Tere is hugged up with him on his page. But look, this is the reason we have to be prepared to protect not ourselves. I don't really care about myself. I can take a lick and keep on ticking. But these little ones, our wives, our daughters, our little ones, that's what it's all about. That's what this lesson is all about. So when they keep asking me, why you gotta have so many guns? Look at her. Wanna see why I got so many guns? Just look. Cause everybody yeah, loves yeah, yeah. Journey. Hey baby. Journey. Say I. I. Love. Love. My. I'm daddy. Yeah. <laughs> good job, good job. Now I'm gonna hand her back to her Uncle Z. What she's going to do is she's going to get bored in a second, bust up out the door, interrupt the whole show. But let's get back to what I was about to do before my little chocolate princess came into play. I want y'all to see how many veiled and not so veiled stereotypes y'all catch within this little video. It's only three minutes. This is Iraq, Iraq Veteran 8888. And the title of this video is called Ghetto Marksmanship. See if I can let y'all see this. What's going on here? There it is. Go ahead and play it. It's called ghetto marksmanship. Now, when you say get, when they say ghetto, uh, I told you what she was gonna do. When they say ghetto, you know who they're talking about. This is Iraq veteran, Mars to raise homeboy. Ghetto marksmanship. Take a look. Urban. When you hear ghetto, when you hear urban, you know they mean black. Grab your balls. Okay. Now you can. You, can you see where I'm coming from here? He's shooting two guns at once. Basically, this is how stupid black thugs shoot in their minds. This is Iraq veteran 8888. Marsh Therese, homeboy. Y'all get a good look at that. Now they're shooting, grabbing their crotches. Shooting, grabbing their crotches. Look at that. 
Now they doing a the drive. <laughs> now you tell me these ain't all stereotypes right here. Stereotypes. All they, what's in their mind about black people? Ghetto marksmanship. Ghetto marksmanship here. You can go watch it on YouTube at any time. Type in Iraq Veteran 8888 Ghetto Marksmanship. They're doing a drive-by shooting with their crotch, hands on their crotch. You see this? These are the people that our Second Amendment black men are telling us it's okay to join. Call the yard nowhere. Uh, what's the other guy's name? Maj Tere, Black Guns Matter. Enough of that. Enough of that ghetto stuff. Okay. Now, I decided to start us out with that video for a reason. Uh, whenever the blacks, I hate to say it like that, but, you know, blacks are more monolithic than you think, or at least we used to be. Whenever we want to get involved with guns or whenever we become concerned with protecting ourselves and our families, we look to find knowledge and advice. They say Carleon Nowhere is the coon train conductor. Yeah, he might not be the conductor, but he showed up in the front, the front, uh, the front car of the train. Okay, when, when we want to get involved, I do not know what Journey is doing out here, but that's just a part of the young life. When you live in the young life, you gotta have a black wife and you gotta have these black daughters and sometimes the black daughters don't do what you want when you want, so that's just a part of it. But she'll quiet down in a second. But anyway, we look for people to give us knowledge and information when it comes to guns. Unfortunately, blacks have been conditioned to dislike and hate guns from the plantation when they made laws and practices and torture techniques to punish and to uh, Detour any black person caught with a weapon. And so when we come in to gun ownership, when we decide to take responsibility for protecting ourselves, we often don't have anybody who looks like us to give us this leadership and this guidance. Well, unfortunately, the NRA and people of that ilk, they know this, and so they prop people up to give us this guidance. And these people do not have a black nationalist ideology. These people are not, the people who they give us are not about nation building. That's why people, they see me, and they see my stance on guns, and they see my stance on protection, and they think that I would be a big fan of Carleon Noir. What the hell is his name? Mm -hmm. I don't know what the hell his name is. And then you got this other guy, Black Guns Matter, Marsh Terrain. They think that I would be a big fan of these guys, but absolutely not. Because for me to get behind somebody, they have the correct they have to have the correct ideology. And just because you're promoting guns and gun knowledge, what is your foundational principles? And my foundational principles are black nation building. And that means my foundational principles are black family building. And that means I'm only gonna follow somebody with the mindset of a Garvey. And just because you advocate guns doesn't mean you know what the hell you're talking about when it comes to our people. And so when you're telling us to join hands with somebody like Iraq Veteran 8888, that means you don't know what the hell you're talking about as far as the direction of our people and you're leading us to death. Okay? Now, let's, let's do this. Let's focus on the first question in my outline. The first question is, can black gun owners... Can blacks who want to protect themselves, can blacks who want to defend their families and their communities, can we join hands and align with right-wing, white, conservative, gun, Second Amendment, NRA advocates? What do you think, Vern? No. Lean in for Instagram. I don't believe oh, Come on, I'll let, you, let me make some space for Big Vern. Let me make some space for the warlord. Okay. Uh, what do you believe? I think, uh, I don't think so. I think, first of all, we got to make connections with each other. Mm -hmm. We can't go outside by race mm -hmm. looking for people to protect us. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. Why not? Because, uh, just like other times in history, they may put on, like, as friends, mm -hmm. but as mm -hmm. soon as you trust them, mm -hmm. they'll split your throat. <laughs> 
All right, that's why I brought Big Burn in for this conversation. But I like what um, my boy Rogue1831, he already said it. When I started pondering this question, because this is what Kalyon Nuair is employed by the NRA, and, and Maj Teray won't ever say a word against Kali, their friends. They're, they're friends, and they're all underneath the NRA. They go to these events. And so they'll tell us, that uh, they'll tell us that it's okay, they're our brothers, you're just being racist, you're just hating on me. Okay, well, John Henry Clark already gave us the answer to this question. If you're asking me, can we unite with these right-wing gun advocates, these southern militia, John Henry Clark already told us that we have no friends. Zeke just said it. My boy 1831 just said it. You already know we have no friends. And do you think I'm going to believe Kali on the world over John Henry Clark? Or Chancellor Williams? Absolutely hell to tell no. Okay? Now, on top of that, if I was going to take a risk, right? And pretend like we did have friends. Do you think all right, veteran 8888 would be the one I'd risk it for. Or James Jaeger. Okay, let's let's put that to the side for a second. Let's talk about, we, you know what, since we're on Iraq and Jaeger already, let's just put it all together. Right wing gun nuts, the NRA. Let's just go through why we can't trust them. I want nothing to do with them because I know their true intentions. Right? I don't want anything to do with them. Now, number one, whew, Iraq veteran 8888, one of the most prominent, well-known, followed, supported voices in the right-wing NRA gun community, and this is Marsh Ray's homeboy. They've got pictures hugged up on Instagram. He, his name itself is racist. Hell Hitler, eighth letter in the alphabet, Iraq 8888. Okay, I didn't even know that to some of my followers pointed it out to me. I was trying to figure out could we even uh, associate with these people. They said his name is racist. I researched the letter, the number eight. When you see eight, 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 this is a racist Nazism symbol. The eighth letter in the alphabet. Okay, uh, Rogue eighteen thirty one threw it out before I had a chance to get to it. But check this out. Now I just showed you him spewing all of his negative stereotypes. I posted another video earlier, be, beyond just the one with the ghetto marksmanship, he did another one called um, Public Safety Announcement, where he just did all his negative stereotypes talking about, it's sure tough living in the ghetto, I got shot last night living in the ghetto, oh it was just ridiculous, right? Now, beyond the stereotypes, beyond the name. I was watching another one of his videos and he referenced the Greek mythological deity Odin, right? Not Greek, German. Now, I don't know much about German mythology, but I researched it because he shot a shot. He said, he, I missed that. Odin would have wanted some thunder. I'm like, who the hell is that? Who, who, who's Odin? So I go, I go to research it. I go to research it, and there's this uh, religion called Odinism, right? And the white supremacists in America are getting fed up with Christianity because it's not white enough. And so they are starting to cling uh, harder and harder to German mythology. And one of the key gods in all of that is Odin, right? And this is Iraq veteran 8888. He's referencing Odin in his videos. Had I not researched it, I would know it. Research Odinism, put it like this. Google, I'll do the work. I, I, I'll go ahead and show you something I found here. If you Google German mythology and then German mythology and white supremacy, one of the first articles that will come up is this one. I don't know how clearly you guys can see it. It's pretty blurred here. Facebook can see it well. One of the first articles that will come up is called The New Religion of Choice for White Supremacists. 
All right, and it's a story about two white supremacists that were plotting to kill some blacks and some Jews. And it talks about how traditionally the Klan and those like them were going to be Christians. They claim to be Christians, but now Christianity is not enough. And so now they're going to Odinism, sometimes called Asatru, a modern expression of an ancient polytheistic Nordic belief system. Right? So Iraq veteran 8888 is a white supremacist. <laughs> okay, let's just get that out of the way. Now let's go to Yeager. James Yeager, he really blew up when Obama made a comment about gun control and James Yeager's, uh, he threatened to go start killing people, right? James Yeager is out of Tennessee and he has a company called Tactical Response. Well, European Americans, white Americans, they pay him big, big bucks to take them out and train them year round in how to fight, how to fight in teams and how to kill. I want y'all to get this in your mind. The Europeans in America are paying trained professionals because Jaeger used to be a contractor in Iraq. A high risk uh, a civilian contractor killed, uh, hired to kill Iraqis. Okay. European Americans are paying thousands and millions of dollars to go to men like James Jaeger year round and pay them to train them in fighting and combat. Okay, did, did I make that clear? They're spending their money to buy rifles, particularly AR-15s, those are their favorites, to go and be trained. What the hell are we spending our money for? Right? What are we spending our money on? So Zeke, let me ask you a question. 17 year old now. If the European Americans are paying professionals like James Jaeger to train them in how to fight, what does that mean for the blacks? We should be training too. We should be training too. There go journey. Let her in, Well, as you all know, if you have a two-year-old and she wants to come in, you let her in. Jordan's watches cars and stupidity. Jordan's watches, cars, and stupidity. Rompers. <laughs> Somebody said rompers. Okay, I'm not going to get back on rompers because I'll go off my whole thing. But James Jager, you want to know how I found out he was a racist? Because James Jager can put on a good, pretty good show. This is what I found out. James Jager actually has a mixed grandson. Right? So James Jager, one of his kids, uh, they slipped off behind his back and found some... Uh, some chocolate loves. <laughs> All right, so I know James Jager was pissed about that, but I was watching one video, and James Jager was on there with another white guy, and James Jager says, I'm on here with another great American. He makes, th this is a joke to him. He says, I'm on here with another great American. Well, at least I thought he was American. He's kind of dark for an American, right? I said, whoa, Jager. <laughs> you mean Americans have a certain complexion, right? So if someone get a little dark, they can't be an American. That's what Jaeger said. So I said, let me follow up my research with this. I just Googled James Jaeger and, and racism. And next thing I know, they have a, he has a post up saying that Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization. Uh-oh. Only white supremacists say that. <laughs> Journey agrees with me. Only white supremacists say that. Because Black Lives Matter is a pro-homo, pro-integrationist, weak, no backbone, no threat organization. And only a white supremacist would call them terrorists because white supremacists don't want any kind of black unity. So anything black is terroristic to them because all blacks are a threat. So I just went over two... Johnny, what's going on? Yes. But you gotta let me talk. Okay, I just went over two of the most. <laughs> she gonna kick you hot. I just went over two of the most well-known NRA Second Amendment big-time YouTube social media celebrities, and they both are clear-cut racist. So why would Kalyan Nawar? Because Kalyan Nawar has videos with James Jager sitting up there skinning and grinning. Don't get me started. But anyway. 
Let's talk about the NRA itself because they'll say just because those two guys are in the NRA, they can't be representatives of the NRA. Let's talk about LaPierre. That's the current president of the NRA. Whenever this man goes out and speaks to gen up support for his organization, he refers to terrorists. Terrorists. Johnny got that. Terrorists. Terrorists. Drug dealers, dealers. knockout gamers, home invaders, and carjackers. I'm going to have to put Journey out in a second. But these are the buzzwords that he uses. Take that out of my Journey wants to broadcast the show tonight, but I can't let her do it. She's not ready yet. She'll be broadcasting soon. I'm sorry, Journey. Okay. He uses the same racially coded language that Ronald Reagan used when he was running for president, right? When Ronald Reagan ran for the White House the first time, he went to Philadelphia, Mississippi. This is where they, the civil rights workers were killed and they made the movie Mississippi Burning about it. Uh, Reagan came back to that same county, Neshoba County, and he went there to give a speech because he knew his whole candidacy was going to be based on white supremacy and getting white people fired up to go against black people. But you couldn't say nigger anymore at that time. So he developed words like welfare queen, criminal, thug, drug dealer, war on drugs. He developed all these words to talk about blacks without saying blacks. And that's exactly what LaPierre does whenever he gets, whenever he wants to get his uh, NRA people fired up. He says, you got drug dealers out here, home invaders, knockout gamers. What the hell is a knockout gamer? That's a phenomenon that the media tried to perpetuate as a nationwide problem where we're in inner city urban, those are other cold words for black, inner city urban kids would be going around trying to knock out innocent people and it, it, he used it as justification to arm yourselves and kill more black kids, right? So LaPierre uses racially coded language just like Reagan did to gen up support and get his base fired up. So not only are the prominent members, Jaeger, Iraq War Veteran 8888, are they absolutely and clearly racist? So is the damn president of the NRA. And, and, and good Lord, how much more evidence do we need? But this is the thing that really uh, perplexed me a little bit. I did some research on the NRA. And up until the late 60s, early 70s, they were actually a moderate organization, and their main aims were a hunting, a recreational shooting, and they supported gun control. They even wrote gun control laws up until the late 60s, early 70s, right? But throughout this time, there was an internal war going on between the real extremists, the real, the real right-wing, all-the-way extremists, and the moderate racists, I guess you would call them. And in 77, the extremists won. And a guy named Harlan Carter, who, as a young man, had been convicted of murder because he pursued a young Mexican boy at gunpoint. There were three Mexican boys he ordered the Mexican boys back to his home to be questioned about a crime he thought they'd done. They said, no, I'm not going to go with you. And he shot one of them dead with a 12-gauge shotgun. He did three years in jail. He's a convicted felon. And in 1977, he took over the NRA. Right? And at that point, the whole spectrum of it changed. And since that time, from what I've studied, it's been a right-wing, white supremacist, neo-Nazi, paramilitary organization. So I say, anybody who's telling us that we have brothers in James Jager, anybody who's telling us that we have brothers in Iraq veteran 8888, they are not Garveyites. They are not into black nation building. They know nothing about what the hell we're trying to do. But just do me this favor.
Because I just saw Marge Teray, uh might be dating, what's the bimbo? The white, um, she's dumb as hell. She just got fired. Tommy Laron. Laron. That's her name? I don't know her name. Just give them a little test. See if they have black wives. And if these men over 30 and they ain't got no black wives and black families and they ain't into building a family and the community, then why the hell would I follow them anyway? Right? Somebody got to check these dudes. Just because they know something about a gun, right? If they, I, I, I saw Marsh Ray post on this thing that he thought hit cop 45. That's another, uh, that's another Southern white supremacist gun owner, advocate. Uh, Marsh Ray said, I wish hit cop 55 was my granddaddy. How the hell are you a proud African wishing a European was your granddaddy? That makes sense to you? You ever wish a European was your granddaddy? <laughs> okay, some of this stuff just ain't making no sense. So no, absolutely no. We do not need to team up with Southern uh, conservative white supremacists uh, NRA advocates. No, the NRA is not a place for black people. Somebody said, well, it, when they advocate for things, it really benefits all of us. Well, let me ask you this. Philando Castillo, not a felon, lawfully exercising his Second Amendment rights, had a permit to carry, pulled over by the cops for uh, what was a taillight violation, supposedly. Shot dead. He told the officer, I'm a licensed carrier. I have my license on me and I have my gun. The officer says, well, give me your ID. He reaches for the ID and the officer blows him away. Right? Does the NRA come out and say this black man's rights have been violated? This is a offense to the Second Amendment. This is a damn shame. Does the NRA come out and say that? Nope. The first night they say nothing. They wait a couple days for they even mention it. And when they mention it, they refuse to even say Castillo's name. Yeah, this is the organization that supports all of our gun rights. Yeah, the hell, whatever, the hell ever. Right? They didn't even say his name. And when they addressed it, they just said, well, what happened in Minnesota sounds kind of bad, but we can't say nothing now. We have to wait till later. What? Now, if the police had pulled over a white man, right, a white law-abiding citizen in front of his woman and his child and shot him to death for no reason, he was lawfully carrying a firearm, that white man would have became a celebrity. They would have took up his cause and came out strong as hell. But with the black man Castillo, oh, we have to wait till we get some more facts. He dead. It was on Facebook Live. <laughs> How many more facts you need? Okay. I'm going to let the NRA go. But just know, um, Black Guns Matter came in Jacksonville a few months ago. A lot of people are saying, Vern, I know you're going to go. Hell no, I ain't. Because guns aren't the number one thing. If we don't have the right ideology, guns don't mean a damn thing. If we don't have the right ideology, we'll take the guns and shoot each other. And those people, Marge Ture and Carleon Nowhere, don't have the right ideology. They puppets. Now, did I miss anything on that topic? Okay, now I'm dealing with black people. And I know I'm dealing with Christians in this conversation. So as a Christian myself, a follower of Christ, I know I have to I know I have to address this topic. Because the blacks have been taught a watered down, Eurocentric, whitewashed, poisonous distortion of Christianity. So the question that black people still have is, should we be even defending ourselves? What you say, Vern? Oh, should we be defending ourselves? Yeah. Of course we should. Um, nobody else ain't gonna do it. But you're a Christian. You have to turn the other cheek. <laughs> you gotta uh, also know when God is uh, telling you to take action, because faith without work is dead. Damn! <laughs> Did you hear it? Hmm. Burn Jackson said, "No, nah, that's a hey. That's not even a question." Rogue eighteen thirty one. Yes, it is. 
I'm telling you now, it may not be a question for you, it may not be a question for me, <laughs> but for many of our Christian brethren, it's a question. All right? So they say, the Bible says, turn the other cheek. The Bible says, slaves obey your masters. The Bible says to be peaceful and humble. Okay, it does. Now, you got to you got to you got to look at the context within which Jesus was teaching these verses. Now, if you don't if you're not a Christian, if you don't follow the Bible, then you're right. It's a non-question. But I'm talking to the Christians right now. Because most black people are still Christians. I'm talking to the Christians. The Bible says that Jesus once instructed all of his disciples to go by swords. Y'all remember that verse? And he told them, if you don't have any money to buy a sword, sell your clothes and get you some weapons. All right. At that time now and then, the sword would be equivalent to a gun, a deadly weapon. So there's clearly an occasion or a circumstance or a position in time and space where weapons are essential. Jesus said it. Amen? Amen. Okay. Now, I remember when Jesus saw greed, corruption, and filth going on in the church. He did not go and negotiate with the people in the church. He ran right up in the temple and went straight in that turn on them, beating people down, turning tables over, and acting like a black nationalist. So there is a time where you have to use a little physical force. Amen? Amen. Amen. There's also a verse in the Bible that says if you're going to go into rob a strong man's house, you got to first tie that man up. Why? Because it's only natural that that man is going to try to whoop your ass. <laughs> it's only natural. Right? It's only natural. And for those who still like the Old Testament, see, because these new Christians, they try to get all the way out of the Old Testament and forget about it. I do an Old Testament verse in here. And it said, there's a time and a season for all things. A time for peace and a time for war. So even the Bible, although it's been altered many times, it still lets us know sometimes you have to go. And sometimes you have to go hard. So my thing is this. When Jesus said, turn the other cheek, was he not talking to Jews about their interactions with other Jews? And how they should conduct themselves on a daily basis. When Jesus said turn the other cheek, guess what? I agree with that. I wish more, more black people in America, when dealing with black people, okay, this is what Jesus was talking about amongst your own people. I wish they would turn the other cheek. Meaning if someone offends you, steps on your shoe, bumps you in line, you don't have to kill him. Right? You don't have to blow, him, you don't have to blow his head off. But, He's not talking about when you're dealing with your true enemy. Your brother's not your enemy. Now, damn it, you have an enemy. You have an enemy. And if you turn your cheek to that enemy, you won't have no cheek, big fella. I'm just going to tell you like it is. All right. Now, now that we established that we have no business associating with right-wing uh gun advocates, uh, white supremacists, they, they're all, they all want us, the reason they want their guns and the reason you want your guns are two different things. Vintage Vegan says she has a, there's a question. Go ahead, give me the question. I'm going to take this question. I hope I can answer it. What's the question, Vintage Vegan? Because I'm going to get into a whole other side of this discussion right here. Now that we established we are going to defend ourselves, we want to talk about defending ourselves. I don't see the question coming up, Vintage Vegan. I'm waiting. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Would you think a person who took any tactical classes by a white person is a sellout? Hell no. <laughs> I don't think they're a sellout. I'll go learn what they know too. Because they've been at war since they left the caves of Europe. So they know the most. And, well, they don't, I wouldn't say they know the most because I know some Marines and other things that are very knowledgeable. But what I'm saying is I'll learn from them. I'll go to their YouTube and watch it. That's how I know they're racist because I watch them. But what I'm saying is we can't be dumb enough to think they're our brothers. 
we all, hey man, this is my friend, Iraq 88. No, the hell is not. Iraq 88, 88 hates your guts. And when stuff hits the fan, he'll blow you away to take your food supply. So no, no, I wouldn't say they was a sellout. If you don't have any black, not a thing about it, this is what black people got to learn. Sometimes we think that we have to go learn from the European because we don't feel like there are any black people who know. Let me ask you a question. Geronimo Pratt came out of the military and trained the Panthers in weapons and, and defense and combat. Robert F. Williams was a Marine Corps veteran who came back and trained black people to defend themselves. Robert F. Williams. Can't let this lecture go by without Robert F. The granddaddy of black self-defense. Negroes with guns. Go get this book. Okay, if we have hundreds of thousands of black Marine, Navy SEALs, hundreds and thousands of black veterans around the country who no weapons, no survival, no combat, no weapons maintenance, why the hell you can't find a black person to teach you? I got I got I got veterans that done came down and trained me in Jacksonville. So if we got all these blacks that have been to the military, learned all these techniques, been to Afghanistan, been to Iraq, know all the combat techniques, why the hell you can't find a black person to teach you? You gotta go to Iraq veteran eighty eight eighty eight who wants you dead. Or hit cop forty five. Okay, let me get off that before I get mad. Okay, Nazi, everybody, I want y'all to realize something. Toward the end of this video, there are gonna be a lot of guns. Let me tell you something, I love guns. You know, I didn't grow up, in my household, guns were, uh, how could I put this? The only person who had a gun was my oldest brother and his gun was not legal. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and, and and the reason he had it was not legal. <laughs> All right, so I didn't I didn't grow up in a pro gun household, but being a man, men like masculine things, and so when I became a man and and I developed my own interests, some of the things from my childhood carried over. One of those was pit bulls. Another of those was weight weights and one that I came to love very later in life three or four years ago was God so this video is gonna get very gun related in a second but before we talk about guns let's see what Zeke know Zeke when it comes to black people defending themselves is a gun the most important thing No. What is? No, I don't defend yourself against. Okay. What else? Go a little bit deeper than that. Uh, Cause you're you, you're going down the right road, but you got to go a little deeper than that. Having the right mindset. Baby, where my wallet at? I got to give this man twenty or thirty dollars. It is the mindset. Nah. I'm not claiming to be a Navy SEAL, a Marine Corps veteran, 12 years on the um, SWAT team or none of that. All I'm saying is that there came a time in my life when I realized that I had a responsibility to protect not only myself, but my wife and the rest of my family and that the bad guys are armed and that's the only way I ever got into guns, okay? So don't wait what I say against a Marine Corps veteran. If my tactical advice that I'm about to give you is not as good as theirs, we'll go with theirs. But what I'm gonna tell you is that I'm a black man in America. America. And there came a day in my life where my AK-47 quite possibly saved my life. I'm going to introduce you to that AK-47 right now. Give me the cheap one. Not the expensive, the expensive uh, $1,200 Arsenal Inc. AK. It was the cheap one. Okay. I call this big sucker right here the Destroyer. All right? 
Now, back when I first bought this AK-47, this is a Kalishna car, 762 by 39. Back when I first bought this baby, before I added all this stuff to it, it was a little plain, cheap IO Inc. AK, and I bought it, and it was only about $500, $600. And there came a time when I was at the gym, I was on the west side of Jacksonville, which is inhabited by white supremacists and Confederate flag flyers. I was surrounded in the gym by four of them who followed me to my truck. And the only thing that back there, because I could have beat one or two of them, okay? Of course, I could have beat one or two of them. But damn, this four of y'all, you got to follow me to my truck. You got to surround my truck. Well, I pulled out that old black AK over there, and they turned into Usain Bolt. <laughs> okay? So, I'm just speaking to you as a person who knows from experience that the weapons are serious and that there is a need for them. Now, again, the weapons aren't the most important. It's the mindset. Now, Irritated Genie, uh, Bob and Rudy, they have defined black consciousness as realizing that black people are at war, we're under attack, and every other group is seeking to destroy us. Okay? I don't know if I could have whooped four of them now, because as soon as I swing on one, then one coming from behind, they pull a pocket knife. Mastermind 700, then what? you don't know what the, the European has been fighting for thousands of years. They pull a pocket knife on you and say you had the weapon, so you got to be careful with them. So anyway, they've, divide, they've defined consciousness as realizing and understanding that we are under attack. Well, if you know we're under attack, then you ought to have a mindset every day to make sure you and your people survive and prosper. Right? Now, when you get this mindset, you're on the road to success. You don't, you don't need 85 expensive guns, and you don't, need a, you don't need a Desert Eagle, you don't need a SCAR, you don't need a God dang going, um, what, them Sig Sauer, them expensive handguns. Just get you a little, uh, get you a Glock, right? But to the mindset is the most important. So, can I prove to you that we need to be in defense mode, in military strategy mode at all times? Well, I have a few examples. I want y'all to Google them. Just a few weeks ago, maybe a little over a month, in California, a white male got mad, went down to a black pool party with an assault rifle, opened fire, shooting seven black people. None of them were armed. He got seven of them. He got no shots, sat down in the chair and waited for the police. You think a gun would have helped in that situation? At least a bow and arrow, a stick, something. Okay, that's out west. Now, just recently, at Bowie State, that's in, I believe it's in either Maryland or Virginia, right? A college student who's active military, about to graduate, stand-up guy. Somebody just told me you can get a Taurus G2 for $230. Guns ain't that expensive. But let, let's not get to the guns yet because we have a whole set. Get up, G. Listen, we, we have a whole section dedicated to guns coming up, all right? So we're not going to go into the particulars of the guns right now. All right? So let's stay on the mindset because if you have the guns without the mindset, you're not going anywhere in life. We got a whole section, Facebook, we have a whole section coming up where we're going to teach you about the guns that you need to have. But let's go in order of priority here. Okay. Bowie State College student stabbed to death. He's standing... See, this is why I say the mindset is more important. He's standing at the bus stop with two of his friends. So you got three black people, right? One white supremacist walks up. Call it what you will. At least my mindset ain't a racist one. Okay. I don't know who the hell that is. But he's probably one of Samuel from Django's homeboys. Okay. So you got... You got Three black guys standing at a bus stop. One alt-right white supremacist walks up. He tells one of the black guys to move. Black guy say, no, I'm not moving. White supremacist stabs him to death on the spot. <laughs> okay. 
It y'all just now. I am, I was a political science major and I went to law school, so I don't know a lot about math. But if it's three brothers standing there, how in the blue hell do one white supremacist stab one of them to death? Huh? How do you let a white supremacist stab one of your friends to death? You don't have the right mindset. As soon as he came at me aggressively, everybody should have got in combat mode. As soon as he reached, as soon as he reached to pull that knife, everybody should have kicked his ass to sleep. The knife should have been still on the ground right now. Right? That's mindset. No guns needed. Three against one with one knife? If you get one stab, that's it. Your ass on the ground after that. Now I know some brothers in the hood who could carry that out. <laughs> no training. No James Jaeger. You know what I'm saying? That's why I say mindset, mindset, mindset. If I see a white man walking towards my wife and my daughter, I'm automatically sitting there like, I'm about to get in my boxing stance. Do you see? So the mindset is more important than weapons. Let's go to Atlanta. Back in Piedmont a few months ago, they had a hanging. A brother, Pac-Man, now Pac-Man, Pac-Man, the damn man, just joined us on Facebook. Put down... EMP. Yeah. If Pac-Man was there, if I had Pac-Man and old Zeke right here, that white boy wouldn't have stabbed me not even one time. Would have been turning his ass over to the authorities. But anyway, Atlanta, Piedmont, they found a brother hanging in a tree. Suicide. Just a few weeks ago, North Carolina, they found a sister hanging in a tree. Suicide. Okay, a damn tree. Now I'm a defense attorney, so let me walk you through this. I'm black, not me, them. I'm black, I'm having some real problems in life. I decide to kill myself, that's the first step. Blacks are the least suicidal of all people. But let's say we get some with some serious mental health issues. So they do decide to kill themselves, okay. I don't decide to shoot myself or poison myself. I decide to go to the damn woods and hang myself. Second problem, that's not that likely. We're not going to the woods at night by ourselves. But let's just say we're crazy enough to try. Can somebody tell me how the hell a black woman climbs a tree with a rope, ties it up, perfect noose, measures the exact distance from the branch to the ground to make sure she don't hit the ground, measures it perfectly so that she hangs her damn self. I don't get this. I don't get it. Because you got to take into account your own height, your own weight. You got to measure out the rope. Hell, if you do all that thinking, you probably going to decide I don't want to die no more. Do you see? But they are always ruled a suicide. Always. So if we got people getting shot at the pool, stabbed on the college campus, and old-fashioned lynched, do we need to defend ourselves? Hell yeah. Some people say, well, Vern, you're being dishonest because blacks are more likely to be victimized by other blacks. Well, damn it, you got to be ready for them too. Okay. Now, not too long ago in my neighborhood, there was a spree of, of, of black teenagers robbing houses. And they would go into a person's house. And on one particular occasion, they went into a person's house. And the person came home, and this was a white dude. He came home in the middle of the robbery, and they shot him to death. So am I saying that we only need to be prepared for racists? Hell no! You got self-hatred. You got the young thug... Uh, feminine thug complex going on where these dudes halfway feminine and halfway thug just all confused you got to be ready for all that which just leads me back to my point that we always have to be prepared right so with all that in the plate Vern you got any other reasons why we need to be prepared Ew. pause due to poor connection okay we back on what you got for him, Mr. Vernon? Uh, just, you got to see. Uh oh, Facebook, yeah, Facebook just went out. One second. Let me see if I can get Facebook back together.
pause. We having some technical difficulties. Bam, we back on. Go, Vern. Uh, you gotta, you gotta be prepared because just like you know, you already know we got a lot of enemies since the very beginning. We've been having to fight to, just to survive. So nothing ain't really changed now. It's just I can't say it's something you don't see because it's not really subliminal. It's right in your face, still. But uh, you just gotta stay prepared, ready to defend yourself, just like it always has been. All right. Hey, ain't nothing new about it. That's right. Okay. Now, once I've, I've given you the examples of why you need to be prepared. Now, here's the first step. The first step is to start thinking. I told you I was going to give you some tips to be prepared. The first step, we back on Kimberly Scott. Uh, can you hear me now? She said she couldn't hear me. Can you hear me, Miss Scott? Let us know. I hope she can hear. I hope she can hear. Okay. The first step, once you realize that you need to be prepared, is to start thinking about the most likely scenarios that you will encounter. Now, people who love guns, white supremacists, they love to talk about a zombie apocalypse. They know they're not going to ever encounter that. They're really talking about blacks. And so what they do now is they talk about a lot of urban conflict. Because whenever blacks get together, they believe that the blacks will start a, a conflict or some type of uprising. And that's what they want to be prepared for. But as intelligent humans, you have to be prepared for the most likely situation. Oh God, what the heck is going on with my connection here? All right, hopefully we're back there. See what's going on out there. Is it? One second, we seem to be having some connection issues here. It says it's reconnecting. I see what's going on. We got, seems like we got Facebook back online, but now Instagram is having an issue. Zeke is going to see what's going on. Let's try to get to the bottom of this before we continue. What's up, Zeke? I, I just I heard the doorbell ring. That's all I'm checking. Mm. Oh. So, so, so see if see if the internet's back. Okay, one second. I'm gonna have to do something here. That's right. Sorry about these technical difficulties. Let's get this fixed here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, looks like we're back on Instagram. One second. We're gonna get this fixed. Get sponsored by Com. But um, Dread like Rasta said he had a question. What's the question, Dread like Rasta? All right, we're all we're all back set and ready to go. What's the question, Dread like Rasta? See what this question is. I'm, I, he's gonna ask a really good question. Black cops joining the movement. Whew. Yeah, I knew he was going to ask. Uh, that was going to be a tough one. Well, the key word in that question is black. Because they joined the police force and remain black. 
as long as they remain black, we need them. We need more real black men on the police force. But how many black men can go through that indoctrination process, that's the police academy, where you're trained to fear blacks and hate blacks and target blacks, how many can go through that process and remain black? Well, I met about three. So those, and I know three black cops that I would allow to any BPM meeting. So there are some, but they have to remain black because it's easy to be a black person walk around with a European mind. It's easy to be a black person walking around with a little European mind. And Rogue 1831 just said that the blue line is a mother. It is. So being black would mean you're willing to cross the blue line. What's that mean? If you witness a white cop beating the hell out of a black person for no reason, are you going to say something? Or are you going to protect that cop because of the blue line? Well, if you're going to protect that cop because of the blue line, you're not black. That's why I said black was the key question. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All right. Now. Now that I've proven to you that we have a, a moral uh, right to defend ourselves, that we shouldn't be dealing with the right-wing supremacists, it's time to get to the guns. Wait a second, not just yet. I got some more tips for you before I get to what I really want to get to. Number one, you have to have a mindset to fortify yourselves. Awareness, this is the key. Awareness is number one. No matter where you go, what you do, where your family is, it's Vernon Jackson, twin dog for Vernon Jackson, that's my Facebook. Whatever you're doing, you have to be aware of your surroundings. You have to be aware of what's going on. You have to be aware of the exit routes. You have to be aware of who's there. You have to be aware. Because if you're not aware, you can have a beautiful 1911 on your hip. Somebody walk up right behind you and take it. Right? Number one, awareness. Realize that we're at war. Be cognizant of what's going on. What side of town are you on? Are Confederate flag flyers over here? Or is this a high? Where are you? What's going on? What am I looking out for? Always be aware. Because the moment you drop your awareness, it don't matter how well armed you are. All right. Once you become aware, what things do you need to protect yourselves? Number one, you need a plan. Right? Me and my family have a plan for if somebody comes in our door, how we're going to make sure the women and children are protected and how we're going to make sure the intruder is dead. Do you see? We already thought about it. Have you thought about it? Where's your, what's, your, what's your wife and your children going to do if someone kicks down the door in five minutes? Where are they going to hide? Are they going to go co confront the attacker or are you going to go confront the attacker? What weapon are you going to use to confront the attacker? Are you going to go outside your room or are you going to stay in your room? What's the plan? I have a plan. Right? But guess what? You got to have a plan for every scenario. What if you're out at the store and someone attacks your family? What if you're at church and Dylan Roof shows up? Right? You got to have a plan for every scenario. I know it's tough, but I'm just... Once you get this mindset, you'll be sitting at home watching the, the Atlanta um, Falcons game just thinking of different scenarios. Now, this is what the Europeans do. And then they go out there and practice. But what are we doing? All right? You want to add something to that, Vern? Uh -huh. to, to the plan? Oh, uh, I have a backup plan, honestly. A plan and a backup plan because everybody know plan A might go wrong. Another thing that me and my wife had to think about, we have rooms on that side of the house and rooms on that side of the house. If somebody kicks in the door in the middle and my daughters are on that side of the house and I'm on this side of the house, now what the hell am I going to do? I'm going to have to bust out the door, get my ass over to that side of the house, and I don't move as well as I was when I was 20. So guess what? But right now, my daughter's sleeping in the room with me. We, we don't have another plan yet. Now, when they get ready to go into their own room, you're going to have to develop another plan. But if someone kicks down my door, they're going to have to kill me first, right? But we got a plan for that. So, awareness and have a plan. Now, let's get to the tools. Home alarm systems, are they worth it? Absolutely. I'm a heavy sleeper. So is Vern. Something goes down 
Everybody in my house is well armed. Your guns don't work when you're asleep. Wake up. That's all I got my alarm system for, to wake me the hell up. When they wake me up, I have another alarm system. It's called a devastation system. So that's one component you better think about. The home alarm system. Number two, another great weapon that we seem to have forgotten about. Oh man, what's going on here? Instagram just went out again. Let's see if we can reconnect. We're gonna have to bring Instagram back. Everybody give me a second. This technology. All right, we're gonna give everybody a second to get back in. We just went over an hour. We gotta get rid of it. This Miranda Mills. What's up, Miranda? I'm surprised Miranda ain't somewhere working out. We're giving these people some tips on survival. Now, Miranda got a Taurus judge. <laughs> now, you go in Miranda's house, baby. You might be running back out. All right, they all coming back in. They all coming back in on Instagram. They all coming back in. I don't know what happened, man. These phones, I got an iPhone. You would think it would be reliable. Maybe I need to go back to Samsung. Right? Okay. I thought somebody reported. No, nah, they might have. God protects me from getting reported. Throughout all these years, I know I done said some controversial stuff. I haven't been suspended. In Jesus' name, don't let them come get me. <laughs> don't let them come get me tonight. But I got backup pages. See? Zeke said a backup plan. I got backup pages. Oh, Miranda said she just left the gym. No surprise there. No surprise there. Miranda better keep that 14. Now, Miranda got the same gun that Harriet Tubman had. <laughs> Miranda, post a picture of that gun you got way back from then. All right. Let's get back to it. We went over the home alarm system. We went over the emergency plan. Dogs. Right? Hey, I know it's 2017, but dogs are still valuable. Now, whether you are like a lot of women and you want to have a little chihuahua, your little pocket poodles, they could be valuable because they are, they bark at everything. Anybody walk past your door, they barking, barking, barking. That's an alarm system. That's an alert, right? That's valuable. Or you might be like me. I only accept masculine breeds. What's a masculine breed? A pit bull. A pit bull, a dogo Argentina, or a cross between a pit bull and a dogo Argentina, <laughs> right? These are the dogs that I've seen that can be the most fearless fighters, right? They can be an alarm system and a defense mechanism. Now, I warn you, you can't keep them tied up in the backyard and count on them to protect you. But if you keep one in the front and one in the back like me, that's what we that's what, that's what what we got about to go into effect. We got two in the back. We bring one out to the front, right? They're going to, I don't know about no Kane Corso, man. I'm a pit bull, man. The only way you can get a good dog is to mix some pit bull in with it. Right? What do you think about that, bro? I agree 100%. What dog you like better than a pit? No, no. Ain't nothing better than a pit bull. Okay. Dogs, if, if I, I would advise all of my single women to have a pit bull or a German Shepherd. If you ain't got no black man that um guard everything, get your old pit bull, German Shepherd. You think he run that house? He'll tear everything to pieces that come through that door, right? If I have to go out of town to court, now this is another one, this brings me to another port. I got young soldiers, right? I got BPM soldiers that be around the house pretty much all the time. Some go down, boy, I got so many lines of defense, it's gonna be rough. I'm sure you like one of my young soldiers Saturday. I feel sorry for the invader. <laughs> I feel bad for the invader, right? If Zeke wake up. But, uh, if you have sons, if you have nephews, if you have young males that live with you or spend most of their times at your house, make sure they're trained and included in your plan. Because those are soldiers. Don't have them sitting there running around. Ah, what the hell? No, they better know what to do. Safely handle a firearm. They might kill them before you even have that chance to do it. So uh, go ahead and get them young soldiers ready. See, that's another thing. 
I say, now you gotta have a, you have, you gotta have strategies for when you're home and when you're not home. My wife, for some reason, likes to go out the door at night. Yeah, I, I don't like my wife going anywhere by herself, particularly at night with my daughters. I just don't like it. There are people who target women and children, right? So it'd be on my responsibility to go with her and make sure she's safe as a man, right? I'm a, we only have a few responsibilities. Remind me to handle that one later. But sometimes if I'm sitting my lazy self up there, I don't feel like giving up. I just say, Zeke, go with her. Or Sadiq, go with her. Because I know my soldiers are trained. They're going to handle it. Whether it be hands or weapons or whatever, my soldiers are going to handle it. So if you have young brothers, young nephews, sons in your household, get them trained and make them a part of the plan. It's not just on you. Okay, cameras. Everybody needs to have cameras. I know we don't want to live in a society where everything is recorded, but they're valuable. I've seen crime solved just by cameras. If you have valuables in your house, if you want to protect your home, if you want motion detection, get you some cameras. Doors. Are your doors made out of cardboard or are they made out of something real? Locks. Do you have locks that can withstand even one kick? Some of these people got cardboard doors and weak ass locks that anybody could push open. Don't have that. You're dead. They don't even give you time to respond. Nighttime travel policy. That's what I was just talking about. I don't like my wife going out of the house at night. Sometimes she tries to do it. Then we have to accommodate with guns and soldiers. But I think I think you you should keep your women in the house at night because there are predators out here. And then you have to make sure the women are trained too. Right? So my wife is, I make sure my wife go down and get her permit and I make sure I take her out and train her in shotguns, rifles, and handguns. So make sure they're trained as well. All right? Connection with neighbors. You ought to have a connection with your neighbors so that they'll watch your house and they'll alert you and that you'll do the same. Doesn't have to be a formal neighborhood watch, but you need to have that connection with the people in your community. That's big. Where do you choose to live? I once lived on the west side of Jacksonville. I had to see 55 Confederate flags every time I went out the door. I hated it. I moved to an all-black area to get away from that, to get away from the enemy. So if you're still living surrounded by the enemy, you got some issues. Get the hell from over there. Somebody said they got a question. Twin dog for it. What's your question? I'm going to keep going until I see it. Connection with your neighbors. Get that going. Get that connection, man. You, you would never know how valuable that is. Where you choose to live and group training. That's why we have the BPM Gun Club. Z, tell me about the BPM Gun Club. BPM Gun Club is a, uh, a branch of BPM members, as, uh, like volunteers as well, soldiers, everything, who are uh, actually ready to start practicing with firearms. Mm -hmm. And we go out and we learn <clears throat> firearm safety, and the do's and don'ts, how to uh, uh, take care of a firearm and be safe when you're out there practicing as well as being ready to protect yourself if mm -hmm. something happens. And we get a lot of practice in with different scenarios and whatnot. And it's really helpful for all of us. Yeah, have fun out there. Uh-huh. So what's your favorite gun to shoot? shoot? AK. So if I took all your guns away, which gun would you keep? AK. But you can't conceal an AK. Oh, yeah, that's true. So I, you can't walk down the street with an AK. I'll probably just keep the AK and get like a Swiss blade or something. <laughs> so you still would. <laughs> All right, man, my brother. Whew. Okay. I thought I could, I could, I could uh, convert him over to a. Kimberly Scott, all you got to do is become a volunteer for BPM. Meaning you make that dedication to those two Saturdays every month with either the boys or the girls or both, whichever one you want to do. And you're automatically a member of the BPM Gun Club. All right. This man said you can conceal the AK if the stock full. No, the hell you can't. That thing ain't going to be concealed. I mean, you, unless you got on a trench coat. But let me get back to my man who asked me, what age do you introduce firearms to children? Well, I got guns everywhere at my house, and my daughter is too. But she doesn't bother them. She knows not to ever touch them. But I think at five or six, 
they can understand that it's a deadly weapon. And once you can teach them trigger discipline and muzzle discipline, you can teach it. Now that was going to vary for the child. Some child children, I think you could teach at five or six. Some you might have to wait to ten. And that's why in BPM, like Zeke said, not everybody gets to come. I judge it more by maturity and 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 the capability of understanding than I do with just plain old age. But as soon as they can understand that a gun is a deadly weapon, not a toy, that it will destroy someone's life, then I teach you. The white people start like at four. I mean, four. <laughs> don't, let, don't let me get to speaking my ebonics on here. All right. So, now that we got that all under control, let's go with group training. I thank you and all of your friends. Okay. Let's talk about some of the things that black men get together and do that aren't so good. Vern, give them one. Um, drag races. <laughs> black men. Okay, black men get together and go to the club. Black men get together and figure out ways to cheat on their wives and cover for one another. Black men get together and go gamble. Black men get together and go to strip clubs. Well, how about y'all do something positive and get together and go train? Right? That's what me and my black friends do. Let's go practice. You shoot the AR, you shoot the AK. If somebody, let's practice. All black men, oh, is that not black? Sky 86 just said they get together and go shopping for rompers and skinny jeans. Those aren't black men. Those are former black men with the European mindset. Now you're going to make me go get Dr. Baruti's book if you keep talking like that. But what I'm saying is this. Group training. This is what Europeans do. And Europeans are really good at war because they've had to survive. They come from the caves and they come from the ice. So it's always been scarcity and it's always been difficult for them to live. So they have to be combative and warlike. So when I reference Europeans, I'm not saying we should be like them. But let me just give you a quick history lesson. I wish the people of Kemet and Ethiopia and Mali and Sudan would have been a little more warlike. What do I mean by that? We have the greatest thinkers. We have the greatest scientists. We have the greatest mathematicians. I wish we would have put more of our energy towards weapons and war. Do you see? Because our people were over there studying surgeries and developing medicine and spirituality and philosophy. We created all that. The Europeans were over there working on death techniques. Right? If you would have sent Imhotep to study some firearms, we would have never been conquered. <laughs> Do you see? <laughs> Imagine what kind of gun Imhotep would have built. <laughs> Probably that one. <laughs> so, so uh, we got to get that in our mind. But go train in groups because you might not... You, when things hit the fan, and things will hit the fan, not too long ago we had an enormous hurricane hit Florida, we had power outages, we, we had people fleeing the state, we had uncertainty, we didn't know when we were going to get some power back on. Well, it's times like that, like in New Orleans with Katrina, where you're going to need to be able to defend not only yourself, but your whole neighborhood. And that's where group training comes into play. I don't know who that guy is, but I'm, don't worry, Dread, like Rasta, I'm going to block him. So move it out of the way, man. Now let's introduce the weapons, right? Whenever I introduce weapons, I start with the most practical and the ones that are going to be the most frequently used. Hand me that Glock. This is where I would start if I were anybody. This is a Glock 19. Gen 4, it's a 9mm. It's supposed to be a compact, but it's not really a compact. It can fit in your pocket though pretty well, even though people might see the print of it. Why do I say get this gun? It's reliable, it's high capacity, you get the right bullets in, it's pretty good at stopping people, and Again, you can carry it with you everywhere you go. I would prefer, if they say, what's my first gun? I would say something like this. Now, I can top this, though. 
This is my favorite handgun. It's a 45 Springfield. This sucker holds 13 plus 1. Okay? It's not hot. It's not hot. Don't worry. I'm not like one of those guys that let it go off. Again, 45. Why is that important to me? Sometimes I think 9 millimeters are pretty weak. But this gun is 45. 14 rounds. It's a subcompact. It can fit in my pocket. It's a little thicker, but that's okay. And everybody always want to talk about recoil. Let me tell you, my wife can shoot this gun. I've trained multiple women in the BPM gun club on this gun. A 45 is not kicking like a 500 Smith & Wesson or a Desert Eagle. They can, it can be handled very easily. And it has better stopping power. If you prefer a 40, that's you. I'd rather have a 45. I don't know what's the advantage of a 40 over a 45. Right? And this magazine, it goes to my full size XD. That's why it's sticking out like that. It really shouldn't be. But the XDs, they can take they can take the mags regardless of if it's a subcompact or a full size. So sometimes I walk around with this big old magazine in there. So get you something that you can carry around and get you something that can knock people down. And it's not that expensive. I think I paid about four hundred dollars for this gun. Okay. Now, the handguns are the most practical. They're the most likely that you're gonna use. Now, often I like to uh, post about this gun. This is a 50 caliber Desert Eagle. Okay. I tried to be tough and say I was gonna carry this around. No the hell you not. It's seven, eight damn pounds. And 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 I, some days I do carry it and it hurts my side. Now, what would this be more useful for? If you're gonna keep it make now, let me tell you something. If you're gonna keep this thing maintained and clean, oh it's a good gun to keep by the side of the bed. Cause I don't care if you shoot him in his leg, he's going down. Right? This can kill a deer, an elk, a moose, whatever you want. But for carrying around, okay. I know I have an eagle, I have a big eagle, but this, I gotta be honest. I carry it once a week. Alright? Now, once you got your handgun down, I prefer Glocks and XDs. I know people like 1911s. Some, if, you, if you're rich enough, get your FN. I like the FN 45 tactical. But I'm not finna go spend $1,300 on that when I got two uh, XDs that are in 45, a 50 and a 9 already. I'm not gonna do that. Okay. When it's time to step up besides a handgun, what do you prefer for home defense, Vern? What do you prefer? Oh, there'll be a shotgun. Go ahead, hand that to me. Now, when it comes to home defense, just about everybody in the gun community will rep recommend a shotgun, a 12 gauge shotgun, whether it be pump action or semi-automatic. What's the difference between pump action and semi-automatic? Semi-auto, you just load that sucker up, pull the trigger, pull, every time you pull the trigger, it's gonna shoot. Pump action, after every shot, you have to yank it back, push it forward, and let it go. They say the semi-auto is quicker, the pump action is more reliable. It's kind of like a revolver. Me, I wanted the pump action because I just like the sound of when you rack that thing, right? But these things, this is the Mossberg 500 Tactical. I paid about $500 for it. And the thing about it is, it's going to get the job done. Uh, if you're going to use it for a home defense situation, I would recommend uh, either buckshot or birdshot because you, I don't think you want to be shooting slugs in the house uh, when it comes to the concern of over penetration. But if you're going to use a buckshot or a birdshot, this sucker is going to put some asses on the ground. You got a little extra thing here because this is the tactical for some extra rounds. But to tell you the truth, capacity. Capacity is the only drawback that I see with this. Other than that, I, this is one of my favorites. And uh, the only problem, like I said, is capacity. And what if it's two or three guys bomb rushing the house? You got eight rounds in the tube and you're trying to get some more in there. You see what I'm saying? So I love what Vern chose, but you got to think about capacity. Right? Now, I ran an AK for a long time. Whoa! Got it. 
<laughs> drum just fell out. I had a 50 round drum, man. This is a Caltech uh, Sub 2000, 9mm. I threw a Glock drum in there, but I haven't, I haven't been running it that much. So the thing wasn't even locked in. But my thing is this. Uh, 50 rounds of 9mm hollow point. I guess this can really get the job done. I put a light laser and a scope on the thing. And uh, you don't have to worry about over penetration when you shoot 9mm. And this longer barrel, it's a carbine instead of just a handgun. It's going to increase the velocity. But <clears throat> something about me just doesn't want to have to rely on a 9mm. But if I have to, I will. This sucker is accurate. I really like it. It's very lightweight. A woman or child can shoot it. But I just feel like if things hit the fan, I'm going to need a little bit more than that. All right? Now, hand me the destroyer right there. As I said before, when it comes to self-defense, when it comes to reliability, when it comes to things hitting the fan, I don't know anything better than an AK. I've owned two ARs. I've gotten rid of both of them. This is the cheap IOWINK AK that once saved my life. All right. This is the Arsenal Inc. AK that costs probably twice as much, but I found the, the, the IOWINK to be more reliable. So either way it goes, these are two of the most reliable, powerful, phenomenal guns I've ever owned. Here you go, Vern. So this is what I say. Every black man should own at least one AK if you can legally own guns. It's nothing better. It's nothing better than an AK. Reliability, power, even distance, accuracy if you know how to shoot. Man, I got a little uh, scope on that AK, that, the cheap one. That thing knocks stuff down. I can go out to two, three hundred yards. It's no big deal. Hell, if you're two, three hundred yards away, I probably don't need to shoot you yet. <laughs> right? So I say every black man should own at least one AK. What you say, Vern? Yeah, I, I say really at least two. Is there a gun that you, so if you had to choose between the twelve gauge Mossberg pump and the AK forty seven, what would you take? For what situation? Uh, home defense situation. I take oh it uh it's a tough one. <laughs> That's a tough one, man. That's a tough one. What do you say? I obviously I want the twelve. The uh, stop myself from coming to the door, but like you said, if it's like three or four people, I'm gonna need higher capacity. Correct, and you're gonna need higher capacity, and you're gonna need to get them rounds off fast. So, but you don't need that. If you you gotta make sure if you're gonna use that AK in a home defense situation, that you have some hollow points that aren't gonna over penetrate because then you're in a hell of a lot of trouble. Uh, Google over penetration. You don't want to be shooting at the enemy. It goes through him through eight rounds eight other walls and shoot your daughter, right? So you gotta, you know, make sure you got the right type of ammo. Now, had to bring out my buddy here. Scar 17, shooting 308. Do you need this to defend your home? No. Do you need this to defend your car? No. Do you need this for self-defense? No. Do you need this? <laughs> no. <laughs> But I can tell you what, I bought this because of Robert F. Williams. And those that are hostile towards our interests, they don't think in terms of what they need. They think in terms of extreme situations. And in, a, in an extreme situation, you can hear somebody five, six, seven hundred yards away. Yes, you need this. Right? So, uh, don't go and spend too much money trying to get one of these. I bought these. I have just bought this gun. I had one in dick case. I didn't tell my wife. Don't y'all tell her. And I was able to get this gun. But uh, when you're trying to reach out and touch somebody, that's a white term I, I, I learned from watching James Drager and all those other right wingers. When you're trying to reach out and touch somebody, this scar, now it's, it's probably only gonna go about three, four hundred yards with this little EO tank I got on here. But um, yeah, you're gonna need something to go further than that. I'm gonna change that scope up soon. So, 
Robert F. Williams said that it wasn't until the blacks defended themselves in North Carolina that the government stepped in to stop all the violence. So sometimes if you want to stop the violence, you have to get violent. Right? So, I hope I've given you guys some tips on self-defense. I hope I've given you guys some information on who we can trust and who we can't. And uh, this video will be posted on YouTube within the next, I don't know, maybe an hour or so. So go watch it. Subscribe to my YouTube, Vern Jackson. Vernon Jackson. That's my name. Subscribe. Let's get those subscribers up. Also, go follow at BPM Duval Chapter and Orlando BPM 22. Get those followers up on Instagram. And uh, like I said, I'm not teaching anything that's about violence, about hate. I'm just teaching about preparedness and intelligence. Right? Preparedness and intelligence. So let's do what we have to do to make sure we're not leaving our kids up to chance or ourselves up to chance. If your life really matters, then defend your life. Be prepared for life. You got anything, Vern? Stay prepared, folks. <laughs> Baby! That's it. Two seventy eight plus one twenty eight.